So I want us to reflect on the book of Daniel. We're going to focus in on the first six chapters um, over the course of, of these sessions together. And you just start with a kind of big picture. Um, the book of Daniel as a whole is about the way in which um, God's kingdom uh, intersects in real time um, with various human kingdoms. Um, in other words, and so God's kingdom is what God's doing. It's his, his project um, here on earth. And uh, it, it intersects in our lives in the places where we find ourselves. And so that means that as we live in the midst of various human hierarchies, okay, in organizations and businesses and governments, um, in churches as well, um, we, we find ourselves working in these human organizations but the book of Daniel is really about how those relate to the kingdom of God, God's larger project, and how it is that we can go about living and working within those human projects, but do that from the kingdom of God. Okay? It's about um, how we, we live rooted um, in, in God's activity, even as we um, deal with the day-to-day -day projects um, that we have there and the human personalities um, that are found. And so, um, and the book of Daniel, I think, is incredibly relevant, not only because um, of this way in which it intersects with what's going on in everyday life uh, in human organizations, but also because of the age that we live in. Um, we are and have been living in for, for several decades now in what's sociologists refer to as the age of diaspora, okay? And so that was going on before the, the war in Syria and the refugee crisis that we're living in right now. Um, but uh, all that means is that for the last several decades, there have been more people living outside their passport cultures than at any other time in human history, okay? And so um, here in Europe, um, that has shaped a lot of what we experience uh, day to day. And so, um, Many of us are here because of the refugee crisis um, in particular, um, uh, but those of us who uh, have been in Europe for longer and came for other reasons, um, even, even those churches are adjusting because of this, this influx of immigration. And um, so it's relevant because the book of Daniel is about uh, people who show up as immigrants, really as refugees, uh, they, they don't choose um, to move to Babylon. They're brought there because of war. Um, they have to make their way in a system that was not put together to work for them. Um, they have no personal authority. They don't have the basic rights that go with citizenship. And yet they have to negotiate that. Um, to figure out how to live well. And um, they have to negotiate all of the, uh, the challenges that come with living in a place where the religion is different from, from theirs and where they came from, uh, where the culture uh, is odd, where the language is strange. And through all of those differences, they have to not only work there, but they have to learn how to do that while being faithful um, to the God uh, who who made them and called them. And so these first six chapters of the book of Daniel um, are focused on how Daniel and his friends um, learn to live under God's reign, um, but in these human organizations, and, and to center themselves there, to really kind of root in, um, to, to be aware of what God's doing, um, to listen to him so that they can, they can bring insight from God um, into those human organizations where they find themselves. Um, and kind of what's beautiful about this is that we find that it's actually possible to succeed, um, to do well in these human organizations, um, by specifically by, in a sense, living above them. Um, so, in this first session, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 1. And in Daniel chapter 1, 
uh, it really focuses on how Daniel and his friends prepare themselves uh, to, to be the sort of people who can live with, with the kingdom of God as the primary reality in their lives. Um, and uh, in, the, in the midst of this, um, there's a kind of set of issues that they're negotiating that every foreigner, every migrant, everybody living in a, uh, you know, in a new culture, a new place has to deal with. And you could, you could think of this as uh, there's, there's two options in purely human terms um, for how to, to live when you are out of your home. Okay? And in, in human terms, both of these are failing attempts, okay? <laughs> Neither of these really work. But, um, but the two things that you can do are, on the one hand, you can try to assimilate, right? And you just, you, we used to call this going native, right? So um, not only am I learning the language and the culture, but I'm going to try to be Greek, or I'm going to try to be Austrian or French or whatever it is. Um, I'm going to... Uh, to as much as possible, forget, suppress, step away from everything uh, that that I brought with me from my home culture, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna meld in. And of course, um, there's you know reasons why people would want to try that. It's um, at one level, if it were possible, perhaps it would be the easiest thing. Um, but the problem is, it just is not possible because even. Uh, if you speak the language perfectly, even when you learn the culture well, um, people do not forget that you're not from there, okay? <laughs> and so, and maybe especially so here in Europe, uh, actually. Uh, so, uh, you know, in North America, it's a little bit different. Um, it, so much of it is just based on things like achievement. It, you know, if you win the lottery in the U.S., you're a millionaire. Um, if you hit it big and you have a million dollars in Europe, you're just nouveau riche, you know? <laughs> so we'll never forget that your great-great-granddaddy stole that pig, you know? <laughs> you're never getting away from that. So what, whatever happens, that assimilation, um, kind of fully going native, it, it's a failing attempt, okay? But then there's this other failing attempt, and that's to kind of ghettoize, um, to just say, I'm going to dig in, I'm going I'm to set up a um, kind of a little subgroup that is like what it's like where I came from, um, I'm going to you know, stick to my language as much as possible, all of that. And, and again, um, that fails. You, um, when we go that, that route, we, we don't um, exercise any beneficial influence. Um, within the, the relationships that we have and the, and the organizations we intersect with. And um, we, we become ineffective um, for the kingdom of God um, mm -hmm. by doing that. And so there's this um, kind of sweet spot that, that Daniel and his friends uh, find that is neither full assimilation nor nor ghetto. They are, they're learning the language, they're learning the culture. Um, they're actually, uh, at the beginning of this um, book, um, they're brought over uh, from Jerusalem at its, uh, at its fall, and they, because they're of royal blood, um, of noble blood, they're put into a program that's really aimed at assimilating them. Okay, so they're, um, they're in a special program where they're introduced um, to the language and the literature of the Chaldeans, and they're learning the customs of the court, and it's designed to, to make them fit in. And so what they find is that, that there's a kind of third way um, within the kingdom of God that, um, that they discover. And it's one in which they do learn the language and the culture so that they can um, be of use there, um, but they do this without... <clears throat> without losing that identity of being those that are there under God's reign, mm -hmm. um, uh, there for God's purposes. Um, and by rooting themselves then in, in God's work, they negotiate this way of living in the Babylonian Empire as it then becomes the Median, as it then becomes the Persian, right? Um, and and, and 
kind of operating through all of these different human organizations as they change over in time. Over the course of 30 some odd years, um, Daniel and, and his friends are able to, um, to move in and out of these human organizations, but to do so, um, a benefit to those human organizations because um, they're, they're working from God and, and, and his ways. So how is it that, that somebody becomes the kind of person that has that, that flexibility to, to move in and out of, of different uh, human arenas effectively um, without, without losing uh, their connection um, to, to God in his way? Well, what we find in verses 8 and following of this first chapter is the way in which Daniel and his friends go about developing the character that, that sets them up for this, this way of life. And at the heart of their character development is a choice to integrate discretion and faith, to integrate discretion and faith, and to do this um, initially in, in something that's actually quite small. Um, it's beautiful here to, to see how they develop this because, of course, they're, they're known for their stalwart capacity to uh, say no under incredible pressure and face lion dens and, um, you know, and fiery furnaces and all of that. Um, but long before there's flames or lions, um, there's a school setting in which you've got some noble youth in a regime that's set up to assimilate them to Babylonian culture, and there's a decision that's made to, to stay connected to God in his way and to negotiate how to not fully assimilate, okay? Um, so beginning in verse eight, it says that, uh, that Daniel sets his heart that he will not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine which he drank. Um, let me just pause there for a second. This is not about f food preference, okay? <laughs> um, it's not just, you know, I, this, you know, this isn't kosher food, or it's not, um, it's not food that I'm used to from back home. Um, this is about participation in idolatry. Um, that's all that this is about. Um, and it's the, the reason why what he withholds from himself um, or asked um, to be withheld from him are the meat and the wine. And the reason is that these are the two things that are offered up in the ancient world um, to various deities before they're passed on um, to a table for human beings to eat. And so um, as a way of, of withholding himself um, from, from the, um, you know, the, uh, well, the idolatry, the pagan religion, um, that is part of that court, he decides that he's not going to do that. Um, but then notice how he goes about this. He says that he sets his heart, but it doesn't then say, and so, you know, he dug in his heels and he just refused. Now, that I think is often um, our tendencies. When we see a conflict between God's ways and the ways of a, of a culture or organization we're in is we just get really kind of stubborn and inflexible um, and we insist and we, we kind of set the battle lines uh, immediately. But that's not what Daniel does. Um, instead, it says that he sets his heart that he will not defile himself. But then what he does is he approaches the commander um, that's, that's over him um, with a request, and he proceeds to negotiate with the person who has responsibility for him in this human organization. Um, you see, it's very easy to, um, to get stubborn and rigid because, in, in a sense, it makes us, it makes us feel powerful. Um, even if it's a failing attempt, it makes us feel powerful um, to, to get black and white on things immediately. Um, and, uh, and then if, you know, something happens to us, um, well, we're, you know, we're being persecuted and so forth. Uh, but what we see here is um, actually that, that Daniel, he cares about the human being 
that has responsibility for him here. And that's why he goes to the man and he asks, he requests, and begins a negotiation process with him. Because um, he's aware not only of, of, of God's direction and God's law, but also of the human realities that he's interacting with there. And this, this human being will have to answer for the young people that are under his charge. And, and, and Daniel cares about this man. And so what it says is that he goes to the commander and he, he makes a request. Uh, verse 9, now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, uh, I'm afraid of my lord the king who's appointed uh, your food and your drink. For why should your faces look more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Um, then you would make me forfeit my own head to the king. So um, Daniel understands this. And what he does is he, he doesn't try to convert him. He doesn't try um, to, uh, to, to insist. Instead, what he does is he proposes... Uh, verses 12 through 13, um, he proposes a low-risk, time-bounded experiment. And what he's doing here, this is what we have to learn to develop this character, I think, um, is in this mixture, um, this combination of discretion and faith, um, he, he creates an opportunity for God to show up right there in that human organization, mm -hmm. and as God shows up, it begins to change things, okay? And so he says, tell you what, how about for 10 days, for just 10 days, um, you withhold the meat and the wine? And notice what he does here. He doesn't, he doesn't ask for special treatment. He only asks for a, an exception and that, that he and his friends would undergo deprivation. Right? He doesn't say, now, what I want are, you know, special dishes, and you bring those in for us. Mm -hmm. No, nothing special. Um, just, you know, test it, and you look for yourself, and you decide if this is a good idea or not. Okay? And so that, that's the request, and God gives him favor with this pagan official um, that has responsibility um, for, for him and the other young men. And, um, and so, um, through this, um, he's given the right um, to, um, to, to live off of just the vegetables and the water and so forth. Okay? And, um, and having negotiated that space for God to act, um, God shows up. Um, he's faithful to do that. And, and I think this is one of the things that we need to learn in, in our everyday life to develop the kind of character that we see in, in, in Daniel and his friends is um, we don't have to be, um, you know, vain bulging, red in the face, adamant about everything as we interact with people if we know that God really is at work in this world. Um, we can, with, with, with peace, with serenity, um, Ask them for these, these moments where they allow us to do something different and then call upon God to work. Okay? And, and really um, know that this won't go anywhere else if God doesn't show up at this point. And we can do that. We can do that because we know that, that God really is living. He really is active. He really does show up um, when, when we invite him into a situation. Um, and, and so that's what we see here. It's a, it's a very simple, very small thing. Let us go without uh, these, um, without this, this meat, without this wine. But what that low-risk kind of experiment does is it... Um, it gives them then the right, the, the commander sees that they're, uh, they're flourishing, they, uh, their appearance is better than the, the youths around them, and so he gives them the freedom to live in a not fully assimilated way, um, to uh, behave differently. And, uh, and the result of this is that 
God works through this kind of um, discipline that they've taken on themselves, this um, small self-deprivation for the sake of living in step with God. He works through that to develop within them um, a character that leads them to special insight. And we'll talk about that in, in our next session a bit more. Uh, but look at verse 17 and following. Uh, now, as for these four youths, uh, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and all wisdom. Uh, Daniel was even able to understand all kinds of dreams and visions. And then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king talked with them. And out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered into the king's personal service. And as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the conjurers who were in his realm. And Daniel continued until uh, the first year of Cyrus the king. So uh, very long duration of service. Um, now what we, so what we find, and we'll see this throughout the, um, the book of Daniel, is that starting with this very humble uh, discipline that they take upon themselves, the Lord develops within them um, understanding, insight, wisdom, um, as well as uh, the, the skills needed um, to, to run those organizations. And they're able to then um, work in, in uh, not just one, but a series of human kingdoms because of that. And this is part of what we find is that when we anchor, anchor ourselves in the kingdom of God, he will use us, yes, in human organizations, but he can move us from one to the next. Um, and we will be capable of contributing in ways within those organizations that nobody else could. Primarily because we're there not on our own, but we're there as extensions of God's work in this world. Mm -hmm. And part of the surprise of this book is that, that God actually cares about the details of what's going on in these human kingdoms, human organizations, and the people within them. Um, he cares about the people uh, who misunderstand him. He cares about the people... Um, who are in it for things other than him and his glory. And his kingdom has a way of moving in and out um, of, uh, of these people's lives and the projects they pursue. Um, and Daniel and his friends, those who are, who are living for God's kingdom in those human organizations, are able to move with him through that and become a blessing um, to the people that they live among, but also uh, contribute to this larger project um, that God is pursuing throughout the 